Thank you, Brother Dick. Thank you, Miss Heather. It's a beautiful song, isn't it? I've seen that song in hymn books. They're all growing up in church, and I think that's the first time I've ever heard a song. Uh, what a great song that is. Hey, the journey the shepherd took to get his sheep it was not an easy journey. It wasn't an easy journey. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, that he left heaven, made himself of no reputation, uh, made himself lower than the angels. According to Hebrews, God made him higher than the angels. He was, he was named and given the authority higher than the angels. Made himself of no reputation, lower than the angels. Took on him the form of a servant, found in likeness as a man, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's a long journey to come find some sheep as worthless as us. But he did it. Thank the Lord. Rejoice, rejoice. He came for his sheep. I, I like that song. It's a great song. Luke chapter 7 this morning, if you would, please. Luke chapter 7. If you're saved this morning, you know it. Say amen. 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 I hope you could say amen and really mean it. Being saved is a wonderful thing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. If you don't know that Jesus is your Savior this morning, you don't know what living is. You don't, you don't know what life is until you've found it in him. I hope you've already found it in him this morning. In Luke chapter 7, we're going to read a, a very common um, event uh, that happened in the ministry of Jesus. And um, then we'll make a few comments. Jesus apparently saw fit to, uh, he saw a need to explain it further because he gave us a parable to help understand what just took place. And so we'll read the event first, and then, we will, uh, then we'll read the parable and study through that together. And I trust the Lord will work on your heart as we do that. Before we read the uh, passage this morning, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. We need the Lord's help this morning. We're not just handling another book written by man. We're handling the very Word of God, and so we need His help this morning. Let's ask Him for it. Our Father, we come to You now. Lord, thank you for the good music this morning. God, thank you for the attitude behind the music and, Lord, for the message of the songs. Lord, I pray that you would uh, move through this place right now. Uh, God, you know our needs. You, you know our shortcomings. And so, Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to please speak to the hearts of your people today. Uh, God, I pray that you would do a work beginning at my heart and then visit each life here. And we'll thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you're in Luke chapter 7, say amen. amen. Verse 36 says, And one of the Pharisees desired him, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. He began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. What, a, what an amazing story we just read. I want, it's, it's amazing for many, many reasons, uh, but just a, a few would be, number one, the very fact that a Pharisee would invite Jesus back to his house. That is amazing in and of itself. The Pharisees and Jesus didn't have a real close relationship, in case you didn't know. And many times throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, it would be the Pharisees that would try to kill Jesus. They would try to stone him and kill him in one way or another, and, and uh, it never happened, and not because they were uh, 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 unable to do it, but simply because the, uh, the time had not yet come, the Bible says. God the Father had not yet delivered Jesus to that end yet. And so the Pharisees hated Jesus for many reasons, but for whatever reason, this Pharisee invited Jesus back to his house for a meal. 
for a meal. Now, just with that simple fact, we think to ourselves, this guy must have been a, a pretty good guy. He must not have been like the rest of the Pharisees. But a little bit later, we get a, a glimpse into this man's heart, and we understand he was just like the rest of the Pharisees. He had that, that Pharisaical attitude that he was better than everybody else. And, and he had that attitude, like Jesus said about the one uh, publican, uh, the Pharisee that stood on the corner and said, I thank thee that I'm not like these other people. I'm glad I'm not as bad as them. That was this guy's problem. He had Jesus over for dinner, and sometime during that, that uh, dinner, during that meal, a woman came in uh, with a box of ointment. And you know the story, and we, and we just read it. She comes in, and, and at the feet of Jesus, she be, she's weeping, and she's sorrowful. She's obviously carrying a heavy, heavy burden. And she comes into Jesus. She kneels down, and she She's sobbing and crying so much that her tears are sufficient to wet the feet of Jesus, to wash the feet of Jesus. She's not just, she's not just moved with a little emotion. She is weeping. She is sobbing to the point of soaking the feet of Jesus. And then she takes her hair down. The Bible says that a woman's hair is her glory. She takes her hair down and she begins to, in the middle of all of that crowd, in the middle of the, the Pharisees looking on with scorn, she kneels down and with her hair begins to wipe the dust and the dirt and the filth off of Jesus' feet. What an amazing picture we see. That's, that's not something you would see every day. In fact, I would be, if I was a betting man, I would be willing to bet that no one in that place had ever seen that before. I'm guessing that no one had seen a woman come to this place of such humility and brokenness that she's willing to lower herself to the feet of a man. The feet were a nasty thing in the Bible. They still are. Still are. I don't care how beautiful you ladies think you are. Your feet are not beautiful. Amen. Thank you, Brother Glenn. We finally agree on something. But imagine, hey, they didn't, they didn't have the footwear that you're wearing today. They had a, a piece of leather strapped to the bottom of their foot, and the top was more than likely open. They weren't wearing boots in the Middle East. Can you imagine the filth on these feet? They, the, the foot was something that was looked down on. John the Baptist, in order to try to describe uh, to the Pharisees uh, who Jesus was compared to John the Baptist, John the Baptist says, look, I'm not him. I'm not the one that you're looking for. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Son of God. In fact, I'm not even worthy to bend down and loosen the strap on his shoe. I'm that unworthy. And yet this woman comes in. She brings that little box of ointment. And after cleaning and wiping with her hair and tears, she breaks that ointment open. And I don't know, I've read commentaries and heard preachers preach sermons on the ointment. And I, I don't know. I, it was precious. We know that. He begins to anoint her feet, his feet with her tears and her hair and this ointment. And this Pharisee sits back and says, I thought this man was a prophet. If this man was a prophet, he would know that the woman that's touching his feet right now, she's a sinner. If he was really all that he says he is, he would know better than to let himself be around someone like her. I can't believe Jesus, this great teacher and preacher, uh, would allow this to take place in a crowd of the Pharisees and, and my house guests and, and how embarrassing and humiliating this must be. And yet Jesus sits there. And I don't know exactly how it was. The Bible doesn't give us much more detail than that. But if those were like most Baptists, when something awkward happens, everyone just stares at the floor. You know I'm telling the truth. When Brother Bobby tripped and fell up here, as soon as he fell, most of you were like, oh my goodness, that poor boy. The rest of us were like, <laughs> that's Bobby. But when something awkward happens, we don't know how to act. Can you imagine in that room, in the middle of, of dinner, here's the Pharisees, these holy men, revered by all. Jesus, the prophet, sitting here at dinner, and here's this woman just making a scene, just sobbing. 
Jesus says something to this Pharisee, and it kind of reminds me of something that my, my mom or my dad would have said to me. It says in verse 40, Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say to thee. In other words, Simon, we need to have a talk. Simon, you didn't say anything out loud, but I know your thoughts. I see the way you're looking at this woman, and there's a few things I need to tell you. And then following that statement is a parable. The parable is used by Jesus to describe, or rather to explain the woman's actions. It's used to give meaning to her actions. So let's read it together with that in mind, and then we'll make a few quick comparisons. It says in verse 41, There was a certain creditor which had two sons, I'm sorry, had two debtors, and the one owed 500 pence and the other, uh, and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that, to he, that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. What a great explanation for the scene that had unfolded in that little place. What a great explanation. If, if anyone could use words to prove a point, we've already known since the beginning of the Gospels that it was Jesus. We're talking about uh, the, the, the literal word of God addressing a crowd and correcting them, and he's using words to do it. And he puts this simple story together and must have convicted not just this one Pharisee, but everyone else in the place as well. Here's a woman who has admitted that she is a sinner. She was there in the way that she was there because she acknowledged that she had a problem. She acknowledged that her condition made her unworthy to just pull up a chair and sit next to Jesus at the table. She acknowledged that her condition made her unworthy to garner an invitation from any Pharisee to come to a dinner. She understood that because of her sins, because of her lifestyle, because of her reputation, she did not have right or claim to anything else in that room. She understood all of that, and instead of saying, I give up, I'll not come to Jesus, she said, I will come the only way I'm worthy to come, and that is on my hands and knees, weeping and, and sobbing and anointing and worshiping. I'd like to just use four things from this parable in our lives, and I hope that you'll see yourself in the true light that you are this morning. I, I hope you understand that like these two men, and first of all, these two men, they were debtors. They were not forced into this debt. Uh, they did not, uh, they were not being robbed. This creditor was not taking from them what they did not owe. They owed the debt. There's no dispute. There's no question about it from the text. We understand that they owed this creditor some money. We don't understand uh, the, the, the circumstances behind it. It was a parable. And all that we're given is that they were, they were debtors to this creditor. One owed a great deal of money and one owed just a little bit of money. And can I just tell you, if I could just make the first comparison right there, my Bible tells me that the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life. As a sinner, there are certain things that I have uh, procured or earned for myself. And there are certain consequences of my actions. I am a debtor. I have racked up a bill that must be paid. These two people, the Bible says next that they had no way of paying it. They had no money to give. Uh, they, were, they were completely indebted to this creditor. They were rightly indebted to this creditor. And the creditor had the option to go 
claim their possessions or take whatever he could to get his money. And these, these men had no way of paying their debt. What a bad place to be in. Now, I understand that, that as human beings, many of us have been there or are there. You know the feeling of guilt, the stress, the depression that that condition can bring. But can I just tell you that spiritually speaking, to be a spiritual debtor is far more serious, far more urgent than simply owing someone some money. There is very well someone in this place this morning who right now you have racked up a bill through your sin that must be paid and you have no way of paying for it. You have no way of paying for it. These men had no ability. It's not that they didn't go out and get a job. The Bible says they, they could not pay it. And so many times people will live their life for themselves indulging and, and following the, the, the flesh and sinning and all the while become more and more in debt. The wages will come home one day. The wages of your sin will not go unpaid. You will, you will reap it one day. And there's people who have realized that and said, well, I'll just reverse this thing. I'll, I'll take care of my own debt. Uh, I understand that I'm not that good a person and I've done a few things wrong, but I'll, I'll pay it back. I'll make it up. I'll make it right uh, by doing extra good things along the way. And sadly, especially in America, religion feeds off of that mentality. There are churches that are getting wealthy off of holding people in fear and, and telling them they can earn their salvation. They can undo their sin. They can pay back their debt. All the while, these people are getting further and further into that debt. It's a sad state to be in. As good and righteous as you could ever be, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. As fil it, it's nothing. You can, you can try to clean yourself up the best that you possibly can, but in the end, it's still just a filthy rag worth nothing. These men were debtors as you and I are. They had no ability whatsoever to pay their debt. No ability. But one day, the creditor came to them. One day, their creditor came to them, and the Bible says he frankly forgave their debt. <laughs> there was uh, somebody in, in the church, um, it's been 10, or 10, 12 years ago now, um, they said they were moving and they wanted to get rid of, wanted to get rid of a bed, and they thought that Melody and I would, would like it and want us to come over and take a look at it. I said, sure, we'll go and take a look at it. We were living in the apartment at the time, and um, we just been married for just a couple of years, three years maybe. We went over and took a look at the bed, and um, it was a beautiful, beautiful bed, big, huge, I believe it was a king-size bed. And um, they said, is that something you'd be interested in? And we said, we said, yeah, we'd be interested in that. And they said, okay, well, we'll let you have it for $900. I went, my interest is dropping quickly in this bed. <laughs> they were unclear on the deal. But not this creditor. This creditor came to these, these debtors. The Bible says he frankly, he made it very, very clear to them. He, he, he was very direct. He said, your debt is forgiven as of right now. You owe me nothing as of right. You need to know that you are no longer a debtor and I am no longer your creditor. I want you to know you are free and clear of everything. No hidden clauses, no secret, a small print, just forgiven, just forgiven. Now, I would imagine the guy that owed a great deal of money probably asked for clarification. That's what I would have done. Like, now, when you say forgiven, what do you mean? Because this, this $50,000 that you're saying I no longer owe you, where, where did that go exactly? I, I mean, I, I'm just saying I have some questions for the guy. I want to make sure what's going on. And that creditor must have had to explain to them that no one paid their debt for them. No one gave him anything for them. He was taking the cost. He was, he was going to eat the expenses himself. He was just going to cut his losses for their sake. Just, just going to take care of the debt. Folks, the application is very, very simple. If you're a child of God this morning, you know exactly what the application is. One day on a hill called Calvary, in the sight, in the sight of a lost world, 
pagan, vulgar Roman soldiers, in the sight of Jesus' own disciples and family, in the sight of a Jewish crowd. And very, very openly, very frankly, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. You see, what he did was he said, I know you have a debt to pay. The debt is ever growing, and there's no way you'll ever pay this thing off. You are powerless to pay this off. You have no ability. You have nothing to put down. The best you can possibly do is just a bunch of filthy rags to me. It's no good whatsoever. But I have known no sin. And the Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us. It says he took our iniquity. He bore our sorrow. He did it for us. Let me just put it to you this way. Our creditor came to us and said, your debt is paid. It's all taken care of. You're no longer a debtor. I'm no longer your creditor. That's not our relationship anymore. I say praise, praise his name. I say thank the Lord for the day my debt got paid. I was hopeless until that day. I was without any hope whatsoever of paying that debt off. I'm glad I had a mom and dad who didn't sugarcoat sin. I'm glad they had me in a church where I even in Sunday school we learned the Bible, not the, not the kids' version of the Bible, but we learned the Word of God. And I learned at an early age that I was a sinner. I understood what sin was. I understood that I had had a lot of sin in my past. And I realized there was no way me being a sinner, me being that debtor that I could ever stand in the presence of a holy and righteous God and be justified in his sight. There's no way I could do that on my own. But one day the Lamb of God was nailed to a cross on Calvary and the payment for my sin poured from his body. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That day on Calvary, my debt was paid. Paid in full. Paid in full. How odd it must have been if one of those debtors told the creditor, I appreciate what you've done for me, I, I really do, uh, but if it's all the same to you, I'd like to just uh, keep the arrangement the way it is, and uh, I'll pay you what I can when I can, and uh, I don't take anything free from anybody. How strange that must have been. How insulting that would have been to that creditor. And yet so many people today do the very same thing. Do the very same thing. The price has been paid. When Jesus said on Calvary that it is finished, he meant it's finished. It's done. Nothing left to do. You're, you're, it's paid in full. And yet, so many people think, well, I appreciate that. It all sounds good, but that's just too easy. I think I like the current arrangement. I'll just be a good person. I'll keep this, this supposed list in my head of all the bad I've done, and, and I'll just offset it with the good. And I'll just give a little more to the church, or I'll be a little more faithful to church. I'll, I'll find a few charities that need some help, and I'll volunteer my time and help them out financially when I can. I'll, I, I appreciate the offer of the free gift, but um, I, I'd rather do this on my own. All the while missing the point that they can't repay had nothing to pay. Uh, the parable ends with Jesus asking the question, which of these two men do you think would love the creditor more? Simon makes the right answer. He says, him to whom much was forgiven. The man who had the $50,000 forgiven is going to love the creditor a whole lot more than the guy who had a couple hundred bucks forgiven, right? Jesus says, you've spoken well. That's right. Then he points to the woman and says, this woman. In essence, he says, which one do you think she is? You've already called her a sinner. You've already scorned her. You've already made it very clear with your thoughts the kind of woman you think she is. Who do you think is going to love me more, Simon? Her or you? So let me finish with this, church. The Bible says to let no man think more highly of himself than he ought. And the reality is, if every one of us will just simply stop and examine our hearts and look at what God has saved us from, 
every one of us would come to the realization that he has forgiven much. He's looked over a whole lot. I was saved as a seven-year-old boy. How much wrong can you really do by the time you're seven years old? But here's what I'll tell you. For God to save me, he had to reach really, really low. I was as proud and arrogant as any man has ever been. He knew the sin nature that was inside of me. He knew the potential that was inside of me. He looked at me and said, I love you. I'll forgive you. All of that to say this. This woman's actions were simply the outflow of her love. You know, say it again because some of you didn't get it. This woman's actions, her kneeling at the feet of Jesus, the tears, the humility, that was simply an outflow of her love. That's what's implied through the parable. If that is the case, and I believe that's a, that's a, that's a concept we see taught throughout Scripture. We find uh, in John, I believe it's 21, Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know I love you. And Jesus says, go feed my sheep. In other words, if you love me, demonstrate it by your actions. How about John three sixteen? For God so loved the world that he gave. God's love was demonstrated by his actions. You understand what I'm saying? So if we could just be consistent with scripture, the question this morning is this. What do your actions what do your actions say about your love for God? What do they say? Are you the Simon sitting at the table looking at everybody else saying, Phew, sure, I'm glad I'm not as bad as them. Boy, they really need a good sermon preached today. Or are you that woman who in humility recognizes just how desperately she needed a Savior? Desperately wicked, realizing that, came to Jesus in humility and left forgiven and in love with her Savior. Which are you? Which are you? Let's stand together, please. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. The Bible says she loved much. She loved much. When we realize just what our salvation has done for us, you will come to the place in your life where the humility will be present and, and you, will, you will do whatever's necessary for God to know that you love him. If God were to look at you and say, I wonder if, if so-and-so loves me. If God were to look at me and say, I wonder if Adam Summers loves me. Would my life declare the love I have for him? What are you doing? And can, can anyone tell? Can anyone tell? That you love your Savior. Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't know for sure that you're saved. Well, friend, the reality is you are a sinner just like everybody else in this room. There's none righteous, no, not one. That's what our Bible says. That means you are a sinner. And because you're a sinner, you are unfit to ever go to heaven. God will not allow a sinner, uh, he won't allow iniquity and sin into his perfect heaven. He won't do that. The Bible says that. That creates a problem for you, friend. The only way your debt will ever be paid is by you trusting in what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. You can't earn your salvation from sin. You, you can't do enough good to offset the bad. You must come to Jesus Christ in faith, believing, believing in him. If you're here this morning and you'd say, preacher, that's me. There's no one looking. Every head bowed.